Greetings, class, and welcome to week number six of. There we go. Hopefully, you can hear me now. <laughs> uh, welcome to week six of CIS 4710. This is Professor Brown. Uh, sorry about that. It was my wrong. So, uh, what we're going to be doing now is we are going to be going over. Sorry about the, this microphone. It's just giving me all kinds of problems today. I don't know what's up with that. I apologize. But anyway, um, I think that, that has it, I hope. Uh, we're going over Chapter 6 this week um, in enumeration. So with enumeration, we're going to look at how we find services. Uh, we're going to pay particular attention to a couple of different services that are very susceptible to attack. And we're going to look at how we can use some in-map scripts and Metasploit. And then we're going to start transitioning over into web enumeration and looking with um, oh, uh, tools like OWASP, ZAttack Proxy, and Burp Suite. And then the speaking protocol. So let's get started here. Uh, we're going to look at service enumeration, which is where we are basically trying to find uh, services from the information that we gathered from scans so that we can isolate which services are uh, susceptible or could have vulnerabilities tied to them. All right. So ports that expose applications are very important, uh, as well as um, uh, it's important to know that a port will not tell you what type of service is there. It could give you, well, tell you the type of service, but not the exact service. So if we see port 80 open, that doesn't necessarily tell us whether it's an Apache service or an IIS service. Uh, Well-known ports of major services um, are not guaranteed for that one-to-one -one mapping. Additionally, network services may have many types of implementation. Uh, and what we're ultimately trying to get at is the application that's vulnerable, and it's not the service that's vulnerable uh, a lot of times. Okay, so the book spends a lot of time on banner grabbing. And banner grabbing is basically where you get information out of the service that's being presented and, uh, for example, an SMTP service. If you do a telnet to the SMTP port, typically the service is going to give you a banner, and a lot of times it was going to give you information as to what type of uh, uh, service manufacturer or software manufacturer is running on that service. Is it an exchange server? Is it a send mail service? Is it a... Um, uh, post map service, things like that. Um, so you have to be able to understand how to speak the protocol. You can do a lot of this manually. There are tools that will automate it, but you can do a lot of this. Uh, HTTP headers are probably the easiest way, and they help us to isolate what the operating system is. For example, you will not find an Internet Information Service, IIS, on a Linux distribution. Let's do that. Uh, even SSH can give us uh, different types of, of service version number, whether it's SSH version 1, which will tell us, oh, wait, these are susceptible to key, key attacks, or SSH version 2, which is the more modern version of SSH. So in interacting with services, we can do manual um, approaches, like I just described, and which is the best way to do it because a manual approach where you're using a service and you're just banner grabbing and you're trying to enumerate in that fashion, typically you're not going to trip off an intrusion prevention system or a scene. You're still going to create a log entry, but it looks a lot different than if you're using an automated tool that could really try to brute force um, and tip off a defender. Uh, you open the connection to the open port, and different tools also can be used in this fashion, like I explained with SMTP and Telnet or Netcat with uh, certain types of other protocols. And even encryption services, uh, services are possible 
uh, using uh, specific types of uh, encrypted clients to find out what type of service they are. All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on remote procedure call and NFS. Um, so these are the two, um, and beyond NFS, also SMB. But RPC, if you can find a remote procedure call that is open, a lot of times, especially in the Microsoft world, these services are susceptible to attack. Remote procedure call for uh, Windows, for example, most Windows platform is TCP 3389. So you get better as you get into the uh, industry and you find out very, very, very quickly that, oh, as soon as I'm doing a scan, like 3389, 3389 is open. Oh, my, oh, you start getting excited about seeing different types of protocols that are open because as you gain experience, you're just going to know, oh, I'm going to try this tool and that tool and this tool and, and everything else. Uh, a port mapper is going to exist to help you query these types of, of protocols. So, like I said, NFS and SMB, again, two services that you hope that you can find. Now, what we're getting better at on the defensive side of the house is locking these down. This is becoming more and more of a routine to lock down these two protocols uh, so that they are not advertised outside of the firewall. But if you can gain access to the interior of a network and on the inside of the firewall, you're almost always going to find them somewhere, somehow. And that's the, that's the trick a lot of times. How can I get inside the firewall? How can I get a toehold inside the environment or a beachhead, so to speak, so that I can launch uh, attacks and infiltrations from that point. That's the trick to pen testing, to be 100% uh, honest with you, uh, because defenders have gotten so really good about locking the outside world out that, you know, we can't always find a uh, an in. All right, so remote method invocation. Uh, there's a lot of protocols that have a lot of problems, Java is one of them, is one of them uh, that they can still use a central point of collection to ask where services can be located. So different types of Java services will help point you in the right direction of where the crown jewels of the network are. Uh, initial connection goes to a central point and the actual port and method information can be um, sniffed uh, with something as simple as Wireshark. Applications then uh, can call remote uh, ports to listen in on uh, for uh, backdoors. So the InMap Scripting Engine, or NSC, is a very powerful tool set. And if you're ever going to go and look at getting your OSCP, you need to start getting really good with the scripting engine today. Uh, you don't have to... Uh, reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of scripts out there already that you can download off the internet. Just get used to using them. That's the most important part. Uh, it supports scripts for extended functionality. Uh, they're written in a language called Lua, uh, though really the script is can be uh, equated into Bash very simply. Uh, scripts can get called in by a port rule or a script identifier, uh, and if a port is found, you can then activate uh, a script to run, uh, and, and scripts can do a lot of interaction with remote services and trying to find out additional information. So in essence, for you programmers out there, uh, you can do a lot of nesting uh, with uh, in-map scripts within the Lua protocol or within Bash itself. Metasploit. So this is the script kitties hacking engine, as I like to uh, call it. Uh, Metasploit has gained a lot of popularity. It's, it was created by uh, Rapid7. Uh, it's an entire framework for exploitation. It is written uh, uh, in Ruby, and pretty much anyone can write a module for Metasploit using the framework. It's very script friendly. Uh, you can use Python with it very easily for the script portion. Or if you know Ruby, hey, it's even easier. 
Uh, modules that are written in Metasploit can expose variables um, that need to be uh, defined, uh, and it is all works through uh, a subshell called MSF Console, which is a command line program that interacts with the framework. So you saw that a little bit with uh, uh, Lab 1. Uh, if you jumped into MSF Console within uh, Armitage, you were, it actually, that's just a, a GUI to get into the UI of the command line of Metasploit. So web enumeration. Uh, web enumeration is uh, a lot of detail for applications and technologies used to find vulnerabilities that are often exposed to us raw on the internet, meaning they're there, we just have to go hunt them down. Web enumeration is very common in bug bounties these days. And you can make a little bit of money on the side or hell, make an entire career out of big uh, bug bounties if you get really, really good at web enumeration and you start understanding the exact nuances of what to look for on different uh, web application platforms. So how do you get good at that? Well, let's get good at HTTP. It is a, um, a markup language. It uses what we call tags. And it was introduced back into the 1990s uh, to uh, pretty much launch the World Wide Web. It requires headers uh, in order to interact uh, with subroutines such as scripts. Uh, it also uh, uh, will have subheaders underneath of it. So they give a uh, example of that here, but it tells basically the server which named host you want to connect to uh, that HTTP then, you know, can work through a browser and it integrates with things like OPNS. SMTP. Now SMTP used to be a really malleable problematic protocol. What we've done with SMTP is we've cleaned it up a lot. We've cleaned it up in the fact that we look at what we are sending and receiving, and this cuts down on spam greatly. We can also look at, um, we've also centralized, I guess you would say, our mailboxes. So with going to cloud providers like Google and Microsoft Office 365, uh, and the like, uh, we have pretty much been able to reduce the number of mail servers out there on the internet. Think of it like this. Think of it like if uh, California that has thousands and thousands of post offices across the state, all right? Each of those post offices is represented by a zip code, right, or your URL. Now, let's take into account that um, instead of sending mail to a specific post office, I consolidate all of those post offices into like five or six, right? And then from there, I have a service running on the back end. The services running on the back end are much more secure because we have a gateway, the provider layer, uh, that is, you know, filtering our email and looking at our email and uh, keeping us safe from spam and phishing attacks and all kinds of other good stuff. SNMP. SNMP is also one of those protocols that a long time ago uh, we had a lot of issues with. And when I mean a lot of issues, it was because uh, the community strings, which were the passwords that it had a the client the held the client server relationship, was sent in the clear. And all you had to do is be able to sniff the protocol in order to find the password. Uh, a lot of network engineers. You've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it a thousand times, are lazy, and they make their SNMP community string, the password to their router, the password to their switch, etc. So that's problematic. But uh, it's used to gather management information about hosts. So you can look at things such as bandwidth utilization, login attempts. Uh, you, can, you can help. Uh, you can also send commands. If you have read write set, set up, you typically don't want to do that with SN, SNMP version one. 
Uh, it uses an abstract syntax notation or ASN, uh, a dot notation. Looks very similar to um, IP addressing at first until you realize that, wait, there's way too many periods in this, in this address. This isn't an IP address. Um, older versions have weak authentication. Version three, which is what we standardized on today, can not only use authentication, it can also use encryption. Uh, so we standardize basically on that uh, across industry. Is it harder to set up? Oh, heck yes, it's a lot harder to set up, but that's okay. Uh, we have to do it. Uh, current versions, it can use encryptions, and you can use tools uh, to what we call SNMP walk to gather data from hosts. This is used in conjunction with other types of devices that are used in your NOC and in your SOC in order to give a good baseline as to how your network is acting. All right, so in summary here, uh, service enumeration, oops, service enumeration is all about identifying an application and version running on a target host. Some services are exposed through remote procedure calls or remote method invocation. In Math and Metasploit are great examples of these and can extend uh, and be very good, especially used uh, when used with scripts, whether they're bash scripts or Python scripts. Uh, web applications can be enumerated and hidden directories identified through different types of technology. That's important so we can isolate what the backend operating system is. SNMP is another way to gather details about a remote system across the network and interacting manually, remember this, we don't remember anything else, interacting manually with the services can help gather additional details and help us to be very quiet, very quiet. Um, so that's it. I don't have an enumeration lab for you this week, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick look at Lab three. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do that in a separate post where I do uh, homework three. Excuse me, not lab three, homework three, because that is due this week. Uh, that is all about, um, oops, uh, using a program, lab three, uh, called Conboot. All right, so I leave an ISO. It's only about a meg and a half. And you uh, attach that in your CIS target. So hopefully you've cracked CIS target by now. If you haven't, that's okay. You can do this. Uh, you can use uh, the boot, uh, conboot uh, CD to do that. And you can bypass the password. Conboot CDs and, uh, you know, very similar programs like them are great to use if you have physical access to the server or console access to the hypervisor, uh, ESX, Hyper-V, et cetera. So um, we're gonna leave it at that for this week and uh, we'll work on getting homework three explained and posted uh, by Thursday. And I will see you guys around. This is Professor Brown signing off. Have a great week.